When doing product development, 3D printing is generally the technology that you're going to use to produce any custom plastic prototype parts. And with 3D printing, you can literally print just about any shape of part that your mind can imagine. And it's a very forgiving technology without many design limitations. And this may sound great, but there's one big problem that you need to be aware of. 3D printing is not the technology that's used for mass production. High pressure injection molding is what's used for production, and it's radically different than 3D printing. Most importantly, injection molding has lots of design rules and limitations that must be strictly followed when designing your product. It's a really common mistake to hire a 3D designer who has no experience with injection molding or to perhaps teach yourself 3D modeling without any knowledge of injection molding. And what can happen in these cases is you may find yourself with a design that can be prototyped with 3D printing, but that can never be mass manufactured without a major redesign. It can be an absolute nightmare to spend so much time and effort prototyping your product in order to get it just perfect, but to only later realize that you need to start the design all over again from scratch in order to make it manufacturable. Whether you plan to design your own enclosure or outsource the development, you need to have a basic understanding of injection molding so that you can be sure that you have a design that can be eventually mass manufactured. And this is what you're going to learn in this video. Okay, let's get started. This is an image, a graphic illustration of an injection molding machine. Injection molding, it starts with a mold, which is two metal pieces that come together. And inside of these two metal mold pieces, it forms a cavity on the inside. And molten plastic is injected into that cavity. It solidifies. The mold is opened and out comes a part in the plastic part in the shape of the cavity in that mold. This illustration shows you some of the basics of an injection molding machine. Basically, you have this hopper where the plastic pellets go in. They go down into this screw mechanism. And there's a heater in here that melts the plastic. Then this screw is turned driving the plastic, the molten plastic, into the enclosure through a gate. The gate on the mold is where the plastic is actually injected into the, the cavity of the mold. The plastic is driven by this screw, which creates the pressure, hence the name high pressure injection molding. It pushes all that plastic in to fill in all the nooks and crannies inside the mold cavity. And you need quite a bit of pressure to make this happen because that's what forces the molten plastic to flow into all the little features that are in the part and make a complete product. Well, that's a quick just overview of the injection molding process. Fundamentally, it's a rather simple process to understand. It's something that's been around for well over 100 years. I believe it was in the late 1800s that this process was originally created. And then even this screw type of mechanism has been around for decades. It's a pretty simple process to understand. Where it gets more complicated is designing the product so that it can go through this process. Let's look at a couple examples of some of the issues that have to be accounted for when designing for injection molding. A lot of the complexities of designing for injection molding have to do with being able to remove the part. Once the plastic has cooled down, the mold opens and the part is ejected from the mold. Actually, there are things called ejector pins, and they're little pins in the mold that when it, the mold opens up, these pins push the, make the part pop out. And that's actually something that you have to keep in mind. Those little injector pins will leave what are called ejector pin marks on the part. So you, you typically want to design the mold so that these injector pin marks are on a part of the part that uh, isn't cosmetically important, maybe the underside or something like that. So that's something to keep in mind. But a lot of these issues relate to the fact that you have to be able to remove the part from the mold once you open up the mold. And one of the first and most basic things that you have to take care of is something called draft. But it's essentially where you add an angle to any of the walls that are parallel to the direction that the, the molds pull apart. For instance, this part here, you would have a top mold that would move up and down this direction, and then you'd have a, a bottom mold that moves up and down in this direction. Well, what happens is because you've got this surface, which is 
parallel to the direction of pull, you essentially get that the plastic wants to kind of scrape along the mold. It can damage the part itself, and it just makes it really difficult to get the part out of the mold because it fits in there so tightly. What you do is you design so that there are angles to the walls of a few degrees, and then that makes the part much easier to remove from the mold. Here's an example. You can see there's a, this angle. They've got a half a degree minimum draft. That's pretty low. Typically, you're looking at one to two degrees for draft. But so on this shape, they've added the draft. Here's another example where this is a rib. And you can see, once again, you've got a, a straight wall here that's going to be parallel to the direction that the molds are pulled. And that's going to create friction, which can damage the part and make it difficult to remove. So once again, you add draft angles to these walls, and now it makes the mold much easier to pull out. Because as, as you start to pull the part out of the mold, then because of these angles, the part fits a little bit looser as you pull it out, but it just it makes it much easier to remove the part from the mold. And then here's a, another example with a, a slot, whether it's this type of shape or just a rib or a hole, Everything needs to have a draft angle if that wall is parallel to the direction of pull. Now, this wall here, let's say here, is not perpendicular or not parallel to the direction of pull. It, there's no draft angle needed from that because the mold just goes up like that. It's, there's no friction on this wall surface as the part is removed. That's the key aspect of draft is it, re, it reduces the friction of removing the part. Another thing you have to be careful of with injection molding is you can't have corners typically that are sharp edges. You want to have them rounded. There are several reasons for this. One being it's difficult for the plastic to flow into a corner if it's a perfect corner with a sharp edge. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And then the second thing is when you're designing a plastic in part, you have to really keep in mind what you're really designing is the mold for that part. So if you have a really sharp edge on a corner, let's just say this was a perfect sharp edge and it wasn't rounded, then that means when they go to make the mold, they machine it using CNC machining. And that sharp edge is really difficult, if not impossible, to machine exactly correctly. And it's either you're not going to be able to do it at all perfectly, and it also is going to increase the mold cost and just add a lot of complexity. So you always want to make sure that corners like this are rounded. But what you don't want to do is you don't want to round it like this because now you've got a thin wall section. And as I'll discuss in the next slide, having uniform wall thickness is really critical. First of all, if you have this thin section here, it creates a bottleneck for mold the, the resin to flow. If you've got resin coming in, it's flowing through this wide channel, but then all of a sudden there's a bottleneck here. You don't want that to happen. So that's one reason. The other reason you want to keep uniform thicknesses is to prevent warping. And I'll discuss that here in the next slide. Here's another example where now they've rounded both the inside and outside, but you can see that now you've got a thicker section here. And that's, that's going to violate the uniform wall thickness that I'll talk about here shortly. And then here's the correct way to do it so that this curve area, that the wall thickness maintains a constant thickness. You need to have uniform wall thickness. And these are a couple examples. This first example where you'll see that the boss areas have a, a much thicker section here. And that's not how you want to design because you've got thin walls here and you have a thicker section here. The main issue, so what happens when you have a thin section and you have a thick section is the thin section cools much quicker than the thick section does. And this creates a temperature differential between the thick sections and the thin sections. And that temperature differential causes the plastic to warp. And that's obviously not desirable. The way that you fix that is you eliminate these thick sections. And you can see here, they basically just carved this out so that now this wall is the same thickness as here, and then even the perimeter of this boss here is also the same thickness as the wall. And then these are just showing you different viewpoints where here they have thick sections, and you can replace that by having like ribs. Uniform wall thickness is really critical when designing, and I find this 
tends to be one of the major things you have to keep in mind when designing the enclosure for your product is that you need to keep the uniform wall thickness so that you don't cause warping when the part starts to cool after being removed from the mold. And then another big issue with injection molding that once again relates to being able to remove the part from the mold are what are called undercuts. And a snap is a perfect example of an undercut. Let's say you've got a mold that's pulling in this direction and then the other half pulls in this direction. So they're, this is the direction that the mold pulls. You've got the top half, the bottom half. Well, under this area here, there's no plastic. That means wherever there's no plastic, that means there has to be metal on the mold. So there has to be some of the mold has to come into this section here to prevent the plastic from filling that in. Well, the problem is now you've got the metal part of the mold that goes under here. Well, now you can't get the part out because it's going to hit on this overhang. And the overhang is necessary because that's how the clip works. The clip will hit on the surface and it prevents the two things from being pulled apart in the same direction. But that same overhang also prevents the part from being removed from the mold. One solution to this is what's called a side action. Instead of just having the simple mold where you have the top piece going this way and the bottom piece going this way, side actions are pieces that come in from the sides of the mold. The mold may that you've got the top part closed, the, the bottom part closes, and then you've got a side part that comes in and that's what fills in this gap. Then you inject the plastic and before you can open the mold to remove the part, you have to first of all remove the side action that pulls out from the side before the part can be released. The problem with side actions is they add a lot of cost to the mold, to the mold and also increase the complexity of the mold. It's always to your advantage to try to do everything you can to eliminate the need for side actions in your mold. That's not always going to be possible, and there are definitely products that use molds with side actions, but that's just going to really drive up the cost of the molds, and molds are already expensive, costing thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. So anything you can do to reduce that cost is going to be a substantial savings for you. Instead of doing side actions, what you can do is you can just design it to eliminate the undercut. And one easy way to do that is by putting a slot that's underneath this overhang. Now what happens is the bottom part of the mold has a part of the metal comes up through this hole and fills in this gap. That's what prevents this area from filling in with plastic. Before we were saying a side action would do that. Now instead the bottom normal mold is doing that, but it needs this slot to be able to slide the metal part of the mold up in here to fill this in with metal so that it doesn't fill with plastic. The slot here is what's really key to making this injection moldable without the need for side action. If you enjoyed this video, then this is the video that I suggest that you watch next.